Mary Bowstead is here from the National Education Union. I wonder if I could just pick up on that point, though, as well. I mean, we take for granted, don't we, the fact that women and kids, women, uh, girls, can be educated here in the UK? We absolutely do. Uh, and when you hear of what's happening in Afghanistan, uh, I saw a, um, on Twitter recently about a seven-year-old girl saying, don't you care about your mothers? Don't you care about your sisters? Um, and women in Afghanistan... Uh, and I've been told I hear that um, they can't see a male doctor. I mean, it's the, the scale and the extent of the repression is astounding, I think. Mm -hmm. We, we were chatting uh, recently, Mary, actually, you were very good um, enough to come in uh, when we did our, our Ask the Union Leaders mm. and you answered questions from um, our viewers. I suppose a question that they would want me to ask you today is, do you expect your members to go on strike? Well, we'll know at five o'clock today. Um, we, we haven't had the result from... When we take a formal ballot for strike action, we have to use an independent polling company, quite rightly, by law, so that the vote is... Um, uh, absolutely legitimate. And in order to take strike action, we have to pass very high thresholds. 50% of the members have to vote and 40% um, of the whole membership, the equivalent of 40% of the whole membership, have to vote yes. So if at five o'clock today we find that the members have voted, it will be that half the members have voted during a time when there was postal disruption and 80% of those members need to vote yes before we can take uh, strike action. So these are these are thresholds which are very high and if they are reached um, and it would be the first time, I've been a General Secretary since 2003, it would be the first time that we had a ballot at anything like this extent and scale and the first time of a national ballot for pay at this level. So it's an, indic it's an indication of how strongly members are feeling. Sure, I mean you know what your members I, from our own internal polling, I, I think that we will meet the thresholds, but I can't be sure. Uh, I really can't be sure. I'll know about two o'clock today. And what are the big issues for your members? The biggest issue is that there is a workforce crisis in our schools, and those aren't my words. Those are the words of Amanda Spielman, the Chief Inspector of Schools. She wrote in her annual report in December 2022 that um, school leaders are finding it the most difficult thing for them to do is recruit and retain staff. And that uh, this was leading, to, and these are her words, to a workforce crisis in schools and children were bearing the brunt of that crisis. And it's quite interesting. I mean, I can give you all the figures about the number of teachers leaving the profession. I can tell you that um, the government only recruited just over half of its targets for secondary teachers this year just recruited 61%. Um, so we're, we're nearly 40% short of the target for secondary teachers. But this becomes really apparent because I now have parents writing to me. And last week I had a parent uh, contact me who said, my son is in year 11 doing GCSE chemistry. The three chemistry teachers in the school have left. Since September, he's been using worksheets. He's being taught by cover teachers using work worksheets. How is this preparing him to take a GCSE in chemistry? And, and just uh, yesterday, a parent um, uh, in a primary school, her child is in year four, uh, her child has had 20 different uh, supply teachers, all doing the best job they can, but no regular teacher since September. And parents up and down the land will be, uh, when I say this, that will... You know, many, many, many of them will have had that experience. One in eight maths lessons is now taught by a non-subject specialist. So the other thing that's happening in schools, particularly secondary schools, is that um, there's an army of teachers doing the best job they can, but teaching out of their subject area. In some schools, it's about half the lessons, um, some of the time, when teachers are teaching out of their subject area. And however hard they work, they cannot provide the quality of education that children and young people deserve. So if my members take this action, it is with a heavy heart and it is because they feel that they have not been listened to and they have no other choice. Can you reassure my viewers this morning that there will not be strike action during the exam period? I think that that would be very unlikely. I don't think teachers would do that or want to do that. I mean, I can't really out, I have an executive, but my strong feeling is 
uh, that that wouldn't be uh, done. And even if there was strike action on an exam day, actually there would be covering for the uh, children to do the exams and all the work has been done prior to that. But I think that's a huge step and I think it's highly unlikely. We know that there's a national day of action called for by the TUC on the 1st of February. If you get your results today, that would take you just under the wire with the two weeks notice that you have yeah. to give. Would that be something that you would be encouraging your members to take part in? Well, we will declare the pattern. If we make the thresholds, and we'll know at five o'clock tonight, we will declare the pattern of action then. I can't really reveal that. But obviously, if we do that, we would just get under the wire for the 1st of February. Is that something you would look at? Yes, it is, absolutely. And that being the case, I have a direct message to the government now. They have known, the government has known, that we have been balloting our members. We did an, in, we did an internal ballot in November. That came out very strongly for strike action. They didn't call us in to discuss this or to negotiate. I didn't get one call from the Secretary of State for Education. They've sure, known... You've had a lot. Sorry? You've had a lot of Secretary well, I have, there's a lot, but, but no call from Secretary of State. Uh, we were called in, at, they've known we were doing a formal ballot all the way through December and the first two weeks in January. We were called in for the first time on the 9th of January for an hour's meeting with the Secretary of State. Now, that is not serious negotiation. We How did that are... conversation go with Gillian? Well, it was perfectly pleasant and perfectly cordial, but it achieved nothing. I mean, it achieved... Did you talk about money? No. What did you talk about? We talked about um, that uh, education was very important and that teachers are very important and we talked a bit about inflation and we countered the argument that wage rises are causing inflation because when they're running at less than half the rate of inflation, they're clearly not. But no, we didn't talk about money and we didn't talk about money either did for this year or next up? year. Of course we did. And we asked directly what you know, what is the possibility we of extra We want 12%, is that what you said? Yeah, we said, well, what's, what's on the table for this year? And what, what, and, you know, and how could we explore other ways in which um, we could get a deal? For example, bringing forward uh, pay, um, the pay award for next year, which doesn't start until September, for this year, which doesn't start until September. So we tried to explore a whole range of issues, but frankly, we were told it was unlikely there would be any more money this year. And... We asked directly, I had another meeting with officials on Friday, and I said, OK, so what's the, what are you going to be telling the review body is affordable for next year? And was told that they couldn't tell me that yet. Now, this isn't good enough. Um, we're serious people. We want to go in and do serious negotiations because the last thing my members want to do is take strike action. Not only do they lose a day's pay, but they lose a day in school, and they are dedicated professionals, dedicating to teach the children that they serve. But, it, but they are at the end of their tether. What would you say to um, parents this morning, though, who rely on schools to keep their children warm and safe while they go to work to try to earn a living in this cost of living crisis? I would say our argument isn't with you. Our argument isn't with you, but... But what should they do with their kids? Well, I mean, they will... That, that is very, very difficult for them. Many will have family who will make arrangements, but some of people will have to take a day off work in order to look after their children. And we really... On a zero-hours contract, they're going to lose money. Yeah, I know. We are really sorry about all of that. We do not want to target you. We do not want to target your children. But when we have... Um, a teacher workforce crisis, when you as parents know that your children are routinely not being taught by regular teachers, not being taught by teachers who are qualified in the subject they are teaching, when um, the government this year uh, is 23% down on its teacher training figures than it was last year, when 40% of teachers leave within 10 years, driven out by overwork and underpay, when teachers have lost nearly a quarter of their salary in real terms since 2010, when no one, you know, when government cannot get teachers to join the profession and can't get teachers to stay in the profession, in the end, that becomes unsustainable and that's where we are now. And a final thought to those who would uh, dismiss um, that and say teachers get six weeks off in the summer, a month off at Christmas, two weeks off in April. As my mum would say, your bum's in butter. Well, um, teachers work the longest hours of unpaid overtime of any profession. That's, um, you know, t teachers, for example, primary teachers teach about 21, 22 hours in the classroom, spend another 35 hours on average working. So these are 55 hours, 60 hour working weeks, secondary teachers about the same. Um, 
They work the most unpaid overtime of any profession and anybody who knows a teacher or anybody who's got a teacher in the family knows that they work harder than anybody else in that family. So, uh, and when teachers get, the, you know, this six weeks business, they might take three weeks holiday, they spend the rest of the three weeks preparing for um, going back in September. When they get to half term, many teachers are lying in bed exhausted and ill because they've just made it through. Through, I mean, teachers have seen the greatest degree of work intensification of any profession. That's, and, and so, you know, teachers work very hard. Yeah, I was overhearing a conversation over lunch actually yesterday. Uh, people sat on a table next to me and, and the gentleman had a, a young baby with him. His wife was a teacher. Um, the child was about a year old and his wife uh, was struggling with her mental health because of the challenges that yes. she had at being a teacher. Yeah, teachers have soaring rates of mental ill health. Um, the pressure is always on them. And we, we, have to, we have to recreate teaching as a profession which is doable, which is enjoyable, where people work hard but they have the right to have time away from their work and we have to pay teachers properly for the work they do. We can't carry on with lowering teacher pay relative to society and expect our education system to work. And it's not working at the moment. OK. Um, thanks for coming in again. Really appreciate it, Mary. Thank you. Thank you. You'll know at five o'clock this o evening. How will you make that announcement? Uh, it's on Facebook, it's on YouTube and it's on Zoom. So um, people can tune in to that announcement. And it's on the NEU Twitter line. You can get the feed to the live announcement. Is that when you find out? Or... I find out a bit before, but... I would have to, you'd have to kill me if I, I were to tell you. I won't do that. Thank it's you. It's good to see you. Thank as you. Always. Thanks very much indeed.